Thank you, Tom. Uh, thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak at this esteemed institution. Um, so uh, I want to first sort of uh, place this. I want to thank my collaborators, Eldad Bettelheim from Jerusalem and Andres Ludwig from Santa Barbara. But let me place it in the context of this conference somewhat. So uh, I, I think uh, what I will be mostly talking about is Anderson localization. So, but uh, for me, it has the, uh, uh, the spirit of random matrices because essentially Anderson localization is another uh, variant of a random matrix problem. It's a problem of highly structured random matrix where you're mostly interested in not the eigenvalues but eigenstates mostly, right? And so one, one topic that was, we'll be going through this whole uh, presentation is that sometimes random quantum mechanical problems can be mapped to classical statistical mechanics problems. And then it makes life easier in many cases. So the first example of this kind is, is due to Freeman Dyson who uh, took the quantum description of nuclei, which is what is introduced by Wigner, so random matrix ensembles, and he actually related them to a Coulomb gas, right? So in that way, you can infer a lot of information. You also lose some information because the Coulomb gas does not tell you much about the eigenstates of the matrices, right? Only the eigenvalues. So in Anderson localization, as I said, we, we are not typically interested in eigenstates, sorry, eigenvalues, we are interested in eigenstates. And the question is whether, whether we can really uh, have some, some similar mapping to any classical objects or classical um, description. So specifically, I'll be working with a, not a Hamiltonian description of these problems, but a scattering description of this problem. So they will be described by some kind of network models, which I will introduce. And a specific network model of interest will be describing what's called the integer quantum hole plateau transition, which is a very interesting unsolved problem in physics. So um, forget about mathematical theorems. It's an unsolved problem of physics, right? So, um, so nevertheless, we can demonstrate that uh, this problem can be mapped to, to some classical problem. And uh, then hopefully one, this classical problem can be uh, solved by traditional statistical mechanical um, means. Uh, we cannot do that at the time, at the moment. So we actually make some further progress by observing that the uh, geometric objects that appear in this classical description satisfy a certain very nice restriction property and then we assume conformal invariance to combine them into what's called conformal restriction theory, a recent, relatively recent development related to SLE. Okay, so here's the physical set setup. You have electrons, you can find them in two dimensions and you uh, put the whole thing in, in a strong magnetic field. You push the current in one direction and you measure the voltage drop in the transverse direction. This is the setting for the measurement of the whole effect. And the corresponding whole response, whole resistance, exhibits this beautiful structure of steps. Right? And uh, the existence of these steps and uh, why, so the, the remarkable phenomenon is that the value of resistance at these steps is highly quantized to a very high degree of accuracy uh, where n is just an integer and h and e squared are uh, fundamental constants of nature. So just understanding this phenomenon was a, a remarkable achievement, but it was achieved pretty fast. Essentially, one has to assume that um, it's an Anderson localization problem and that gives you the answer, more or less, right? I will not give you any det details. So the existence of the plateaus and the quantization can be explained relatively straightforwardly. What is still an open problem in the field is to explain the transitions between the plateaus, okay? So um, that's an example of an Anderson transition where, yes, you have a question, please. Can it be justified to neglect electron-electron interaction? It's a very good question. So, mm, so this basic picture does not require electron-electron interactions. Uh, whether you need to include them or not depends on the question you're asking. And so it was a long story. So initial developments about this transition were consistent with the idea that you may neglect the interactions. And only very recently people realized that exper experimental data and numerical data diverge rather significantly, so, which means that probably you cannot 
uh, neglect the interactions. So it, they're there and they have to be taken into account. And I'm not going to even touch this subject, okay, so, but you're right. Um, okay, so, so, but as I said, the basic picture is that of a single particle moving in a random potential and in the presence of a magnetic field. Right, so, so this is a problem of localization physics and you are interested in uh, the structure of the eigenstates. And without disorder, if we remove this random potential, we have sharply defined lambda levels, which are equidistant energy values. And then the disorder, when we in it's introduced back into the system, it broadens the uh, spectrum into bands. And uh, what we believe is true is that most of these energies correspond to localized states. And only the energies at the original lambda levels correspond to extended states. And uh, the behavior of the localization length shown here in this dashed line is such that it's, it's finite here, but it diverges as you approach the special energies in a power law fashion. So there's some critical uh, power law behavior of various quantities, including this localization length. Okay? Um, so this critical behavior is, is the unsolved problem. We want to understand where these exponents are coming from and hopefully predict their values and uh, compare with experiments and whatnot. So this can be done numerically rather easily employing these network models that I'll be introducing soon. Uh, but so far, the goals of the theory, as usual, we would like to you know, send exponents, scaling functions, correlation functions at the transition. But so far, there's no generally acceptable, accepted theory, analytical theory, analytical way of thinking about it. Unlike many other models in two dimensions, where easing model or whatever, where you can solve things exactly, um, there are some proposals which are questionable. But we do believe that there should be conformal invariance at this critical point. It's a two-dimensional uh, system at criticality with conformal invariance should be, some, in some sense, easier to understand because of the, this is a very powerful symmetry. And uh, numerical results confirm this existence of conformal invariance, so we will just assume that it's there. Again, it's not for me to prove it. It's probably Stas Mirnov can do it at some point when he has free time, but, uh, but I don't. <laughs> um, how do they check numerical? Uh, how do they check numerical? Just yeah, there are, various, there are various ways of doing it. You can simulate the system um, in a corner geometry, and then you can do different corners, 45 degrees, 90 degrees, 135 degrees, and then some relations between the weights of, the cer of certain operators uh, sitting in the corners that, that should be related by the Cardius formula. It essentially involves the angle. That's, that's one of the ways, but there's, there are other. Uh, there are also relations between uh, the system and let's say half plane and a strip, which is, again, you, you can simulate both separately and then can compare, compare with the conformal transformation. Mm -hmm. this, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what we do, we, um, instead of trying to sort of, so the standard approach is like these ones. Actually, we're all based on some kind of field theories. And this involves a lot of guesswork and then the field theories themselves, even when they are introduced, appear to be very hard and sort of very hard to compute anything with them, right? So, we, we abandon this approach and try to do something else. We, we, use, we try to use these uh, ideas of stochastic conformal geometry, which uh, in the form of conformal restriction and SLE, uh, which as we all know are very spectacular developments in mathematics. And uh, they are readily applied. They were designed essentially to be uh, describing geometric objects in classical statistical mechanics, in easing model so interfaces between spin up, spin down clusters, uh, but they seem to be useless to uh, describe disordered systems like spin glasses or quantum systems, right? Uh, where you don't even have positive Boltzmann weights. So, um, nevertheless, we can show that certain models of localization do allow us to use these tools. Okay. So, uh, we consider very specific models so-called network models, the first of them, which, which was introduced by Chokra and Coddington for the description of the integer quantum Hall effect. And we consider very special observable in this model to be able to map this system to a classical description. And then uh, this, this, this 
quantity, which is called point contact conductance, I will explain what it is, uh, allows uh, description in terms of some geometric objects which satisfy restriction property. Again, I will explain what this is. So in the end, con combining this with, with conformal invariance, we can uh, make various predictions using conformal restriction theory. Okay, here's the model. So it's essentially, it's essentially a lattice model uh, on a directed lattice where on each link you specify a complex flux. And then these fluxes get scattered at the nodes and these scatterings are described by two by two scattering matrices. Right? So um, this system allows for closed or open boundaries and uh, it's ideal to uh, describe transport in, 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 in the uh, quantum hole setting. So essentially what we do, we're interested in some scattering states. Let me describe in words how these are created and then I will translate it to some formulas later. So suppose you send in flux one through a particular link on the boundary, okay? Then you have discrete time step, time evolution. And in one time step, this flux can be scattered backwards with a certain amplitude or into the system with a certain amplitude, okay? So at next time step, you again send another flux one through here and it gets scattered. And the flux that has gone into the system also gets scattered and so on. So you do this in a finite system, you can always reach a steady state when you keep feeding in flux one over here, but something comes out on the other side and also in here, right? Okay. And so the amount of flux that comes out on the other side is what I will call a point contact conductance. That's, I hope this is clear enough, but I will make it uh, specifically. So that's some scattering state. It's a formulation of the problem in terms of scattering states. You send in some flux from left and something goes out on the right and you want to just see how much it goes out. So scattering means you're taking some kind of soup. I mean, is this a quantum? It's a quantum, it's a quantum problem. problem. It's a quantum problem. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So this is the actual precise description. So the state of the system is specified by a, so it's a finite dimensional Hilbert space, which is just C to the number of links. And there's a big unitary matrix, sorry, unitary in the, when the boundaries are closed. It becomes a non-unitary evolution when the boundaries are open. But in, in, if the boundaries are closed, then you have unitary evolution in a discrete time. So at every time step, you simply redistribute the fluxes locally according to this two by two scattering matrices. Okay, um, and uh, this is important, but this you need to open the boundary to actually even pose the scattering problem. But that's the usual story, right? So um, now the system is disordered in the sense that these nodes are different, and uh, I specifically choose them to be of this form. That's one way of parameterizing them to use the radial decomposition where the, in the middle you have an orthogonal matrix. Yes? Is it for me to understand the last comment on the previous transparency? I understand well, the full scattering matrix, of course, will be unitary. But if you want to uh, study this point contact conductance, it's less than one. That's all I'm trying to say. So the, you send in flux through one link, but it goes everywhere, and the, the place where you want it to go out, only a fraction of it comes out. That's, that's all I'm saying, right? Yeah. But, yeah. Um, right. Uh, so this is an orthogonal matrix where the T is a parameter, essentially, that is specifying the probability of turning right or left at a given node. And there are two kinds of nodes. You should uh, notice that the lattice of nodes is bipartite. And uh, we have to sort of distinguish them, really. Um, and the phases, which are associated with the motion of the electron between the nodes along the link, are assumed to be uniformly distributed between 0 and 2 pi. That's, that's the specification. That's the full specification of the model. Th that matrix associated with a site or, a, or an edge? It's a node. So it's a, yeah, it's a node matrix, right. Well, OK, if you, uh, there's some. Uh, now, so the uh, TA squared is the probability of turning right uh, on one lattice and also on the other lattice. It's probability. So, so, so the isotropy requires some condition that is over here. And uh, also, it's 
relatively easy to see that the model is critical when these amplitudes are equal. So if you turn away right and left with equal probabilities, then the system is critical. And uh, so then we have this point, which is a physical interest, but. Uh, so the t's are deterministic and the phi's are random? Correct. Yes. That's one, again, there's a question of universality you can ask. And we expect on, the ba on general grounds that this is not very important. That, but that specific choice of disorder allows you to actually make some progress. Okay? Um, then the limiting cases, in the case when you have some re uh, refle reflecting boundaries, clearly show how this is sort of uh, related to quantum hole effect. So in the case when Ta is e exactly equal to 1, you get a perfect insulator where Electrons are trapped in localized states, sort of surrounding, if you want. Uh, well, in some picture, they're sort of, uh, you can think of this as coming from the picture of a smooth random potential where electrons in strong magnetic field perform drifting or drifting, mo drifting motion along the echo potential lines, right? And then when you start filling the system up with electrons, first they form puddles near the bottoms of this potential, and then gradually it's sort of like a percolation transition. And in the end, you get uh, the electrons circling the mountain tops. But uh, on the boundaries, you have this propagating state, which actually contributes to the conductance. So that's, that's the picture. Now, it is not percolating, really. It reminds percolation, but it's, not, it's known to, not to be percolation uh, for reasons that uh, the quantum mechanical tunneling and interference actually change the picture. But you have, I guess it's worthwhile pointing out, but you have a model. Yeah, I will mention it. Yes, I will mention it. Yeah, thank you. So, but there's sy clear symmetry here that, that allows you to actually identify where the critical point is, and so that also helps. Now, um, when we talk about the finite systems, we need to specify some boundary conditions, and I will distinguish what I would call the right reflecting boundary, where the edge state would go to the right, and we're allowed to go, and the left reflecting boundary, I can have an absorbing boundary, which is such that if you send a flux in and it goes back, it's sort of, you forget, about, so this inf information is lost, right? This is where the, uh, yeah. And physically, that corresponds to attaching a metallic lead to the system. And you can juxtapose boundaries and have various interesting mixtures of these things. OK, so here's now the mathematical formulation of what I want to do. Um, the physical quantity that I already mentioned, this point contact conductance, is constructed in the following way. You first form the resolvent of this big unitary matrix. Then you look at the matrix element between two particular points. And uh, you can think of expanding this in a, in a geometric series. And then uh, each contribution would correspond to a path on this graph that connects the initial and final points. And uh, along each path that I labeled by F after Feynman, uh, you simply pick up the, the matrix elements of the corresponding scheduling matrices. Is that clear enough? OK. And so, uh, so notice that even if for a finite system of that sort, there's a, this sum is infinite, because the, uh, you can circle around any given plaquette as many times as you want. It's a big sum. Now. I have to take the absolute value of this guy and square it. And this is what is going to be the point contact conductance in this case. Now, defined in a random system, this is a random quantity. So in principle, I would like to know its statistics, the moments and probability distribution. It's very hard. So I'll be content with uh, studying its mean value with respect to the random phases that I have introduced before. Right? OK. Now, let, before I actually proceed with this situation. Let me simplify it drastically. Let me consider the baby version of this thing, which is a classical motion on this network model. I simply would have a walker that would, approaching the node, would flip a coin, or not a coin, not a fair coin, and decide whether to go left or right. right? So it's a classical motion on this network uh, with probabilities of turning right or left depending on this uh, nodal parameter. And no random phases anymore. So this is not a random system. But it's, it falls under the realm of classical probability. And in fact, we know that in the continuum limit, this reduces to reflected Brownian motions, where the angle of reflection on a reflecting boundary depends on this ratio of these probabilities. Okay? 
so there's some call effect, if you want, related to the asymmetry between left and right terms. So that's important to remember because, I mean, this restriction property that will be important in the, in the, big, in the future uh, is this is one of the uh, prototypical examples of a process that, of an object that satisfies this restriction property. Yeah, yeah, that's right. At, at, a, at a certain angle, which is, can be arbitrary, actually. Yeah. Um, now, there's another variant of this network model, which is, in some sense, more complicated, because we allow now two different channels on a link. And uh, they're being mixed here by SU2 matrix instead of a random phase acquired along this propagation. But it happens to be that this model can be mapped to classical percolation. That's actually... Uh, my work with Andreas Ludwig and Nick Reed back in 99. So this mapping allowed us to predict various critical exponents for this localization problem, which is a quantum problem, based on known results from classical percolation. But for the point today, for the talk today, it's important to say that, so in this picture, everything is phrased in terms of the percolation hulls. For example, the point contact conductance that I would want to compute here would be simply related to the probability that two points belong to the same hull, the same percolation hull, right? Distance r apart. And so at critical point, it decays as some power law, which is known and so on. But um, uh, percolation hulls themselves, if you think of them in, in context of SLE, uh, they, they, um, they converge to SLE6, which is not a simple curve. But if you somehow uh, condition them on not touching certain parts of the boundary and whatnot. They satisfy actually a restriction property as well. And it's again, one of the basic examples given in the original paper by Lawler, Schramm, and Werner. Okay, so now let's go back to our choker coin network model and see whether we can make any progress over there. So this is again, a, I'm just rewriting the uh, point contact conductance. Now I take the average, so angular brackets would, would indicate the uh, average over the randomness, uh, over the random phases. And uh, so there's a diagonal term where a path and its conjugate path get glued together. And this is definitely a positive quantity. The interference term, uh, well, they come in pairs, but the sum of these two terms in the interference term is not guaranteed to be positive. Right? It's, the end result is obviously positive, but individual terms in this expansion are not positive. So, so far, I don't have any statistical mechanics interpretation for this. However, one can actually resum this whole thing and show that this is a sum of strictly positive terms associated with some geometric objects on the network. And uh, for lack of better words, we call them pictures. And this representation is actually valid throughout the whole phase diagram of the system in the localized phases at the critical point for an isotropic version, whatnot. So here's, here's what, how they look like, so what the pictures are. So essentially, a picture is obtained from a given path if you forget the order in which you traverse the links. Okay? So for example, this path leads to a picture where you simply assign the number of times each link is traversed. So it's going to be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, for this one simple one. But there's another path that goes through the same set of links the same number of times, but in a different order. Okay? So these two have to be combined into a single object, which we call a picture. So a picture is just a set of uh, links with numbers, integers attached to them. And the integers are, of course, subject to some conservation law. So the number of incoming should be equal to the number of outgoing. But that's all you need to know about the picture. Right? That's what it is. No, I mean that, no, it's, well, I'm not sure if there's anything to do with short inequality. What I do eventually, so th this, this procedure here of taking the average is crucial. It's actually, uh, that's what makes it, the whole thing work in the end. So I can show you the answer. I can give you more details if you want. Uh, but, okay, l l before I give you the formula, let me just explain, nevertheless, what, uh, what to do here. So there's a definitely simple mapping between the past and the picture. Now you can ask, 
can I enumerate the path giving rise to a certain picture? And that's a graph theoretical problem that is rather easy to solve. You can actually say how many paths there are that give rise to this particular picture. Okay, that's given, given by tree matrix uh, theorem. And, and it encounts some Eulerian trails. No, no, you have, you go more than once. So you oh, imagine, no. yeah, yeah. But you imagine a graph which has multiplicities of edges, right? And then it's counting of number of Euler and trails on this graph, which is a sol easily solvable problem, right? Uh, but n however, these weights actually require more than just enumerating these graphs. They, some of the paths come with a minus sign. And this minus sign is determined by the number of local maxima. If you view this as a height function of some sort, right? You go up and then down. This is a maximum, OK? And there's one maximum on this path, and there are three maxima on this path. Okay? And you need to know this number to actually determine the weight of the picture. Okay? So here's the formula. So this is a, in a, so the weight is a square of a real number. So this, this square comes from the averaging. So initially, it's still a product of two things for different pictures, P1 and P2. And then averaging over the phases glues them together. Okay? Because if you have different numbers of, in pictures on a given link, then the interference term will just disappear. Integral over the face will just disappear. So um, then you can simplify it. So in the simplest case of the isotropic critical model, it simply reduces to this thing. So you sum over all the paths that give rise to a certain picture. And each one of them contributes either plus or minus 1, depending on this number of maxima. Okay. So how to deal with this, I have no clue. And so this is, in my mind, an open problem, but it's worth thinking about it. Maybe one can uh, do something, either enumerate them explicitly or do some asymptotic analysis and whatnot. So it may actually lead to some uh, complete understanding of this problem eventually. But uh, for now, there's no progress in this direction. Right? I just have this formula, and uh, I showed it to a few combinatorial people, and they, well, they scratched their heads, but they couldn't help, really. Um, Well, well, this is the network I'm dealing with, right? So I, yeah. No, you can, you can, okay, the, the closest thing I can, well, okay. So one point to make here is that the weights I get are non-local in the sense that you have to look at the whole path for each individual contribution, right, to count the number of maxima. And so if I could localize it, right, like it's done in ON models, for example, I would be in good shape, right? So the one hope is through this, this conservation law here. It means that there's some kind of gauge field here, probably, right? There's some constraints that are satisfied by this guy. So maybe one can use some height functions and some gauge fields. But OK, it's an open question, right? Um, right. OK, so uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention here is that this sum for a, uh, it's, it's still an infinite sum because the, numbers, multiplicities of links in a given picture can be arbitrarily large. But in the end, the important property that will play a role here, the restriction property, really cares only about the boundary of this object that we'll be seeing. So we can actually further resum this thing into, quanti into objects which have the same shape, right? the same outline, but they have arbitrary uh, occupation numbers inside. So this, these are these are, you know, we, we call them skeletons or whatever. So the, this sum is a finite sum for a finite system, right? It's a finite number of outlines. Um, and OK, so this is a question mark. And hopefully, one day, we can say something about it. OK, so instead of trying to analyze this microscopic weights, so let, let me make a pause nevertheless here. So what we have done, we have mapped a quantum localization problem to a classical statistical mechanics problem. So that's already something very useful. Even probably numerically, one can simulate these guys independently from the quantum problem right, and see how it works and so on. Uh, but, but these are non-local weights, and so it's hard to deal with them. Usually, I mean, I don't know how to so do I, I, to go back to W. W case, are they, are they positive or are they have Square of a real number. Ah, it's a square of a real number. So it comes from a pair of pictures, yeah. right? So, it's actually a pair of pictures that get glued. Yeah. Um, OK. So instead of trying to analyze these microscopic weights, we will go directly to the continuum. 
and uh, we'll use the restriction property. So we'll, we'll end up with the, uh, something that uh, is described by conformal restriction theory. This is, this is what uh, it is. So it was introduced by Lawler, Schramm, and Werner. Uh, so the, the idea is the following. You take a domain. Now, it's completely abstract and mathematical description now. Nothing, I'll come back to the physics in, in a few slides. So you assume that you have a domain with two marked boundary points. And suppose you have objects, some sets, subsets of this domain, connected subsets, which are touching the boundary only at these two points. Okay? Then suppose you have a measure on these objects. And these guys posed the following question. Suppose now I reduce my domain by moving in the boundaries, somehow removing this A set, which can be disconnected actually, right? But such that the D minus A is still connected and has A and B points on its boundary. And I can ask, what is the natural way of defining the measure on the, this kind of sets in the subdomain? There are two ways of doing it. One is what they call uh, conditioning, meaning that you only keep the sets that are already in the subdomain. Okay? And the other one is to make a conformal, conformal transformation from the original measure into the subdomain. Right? And a priori, nobody tells you that this should have anything to do with each other. What they asked is, are there such measures that would keep, produce the same measure if you do it in two different ways? Okay? And the answer is not only there such measures exist, but they can be completely classified. And what they have done is this such a classification and the construction as well. So, so these measures are parameterized by one real parameter in the case of uh, shown here. Um, but let me move on. So actually there are two ver versions of this problem. One is such that the, uh, you can move this boundary only on one side of your sample. This is called one-sided restriction and this is called two-sided restriction. Uh, so examples of such things that are known to satisfy this property uh, in probability theory are very uh, easy to construct. So one of them is Brownian excursion. It's a Brownian pass, Brownian motion that is forbidden to touch the boundary. Uh, so this guy actually satisfies the restriction property, namely that, um, well, simply because of conformal variance of the Brownian motion, more or less. The self-avoiding random walk also satisfies restriction property. And so sometimes you see that the objects in uh, question are curves. Sometimes they are more complicated and they have loops and whatnot, but the restriction property itself doesn't care about the loops. So you could have filled in all the loops and just draw the black object, with, which is the filling of this Brownian motion. Now, yes? So self-avoiding walk, this is numeric, or is it is there a proof? Uh, so, OK, the true statement is that the SLE 8 third is known to rigorously to satisfy this property. Yeah. Okay. Then if you can prove that self-avoiding walks okay. converge to SLE, then, then it is a state, but it's not a theorem. I don't think it's a theorem. Um, now, the restriction property is so, in some sense, trivial that it's even hard to put it in words. I mean, uh, any intrinsic measure would automatically satisfy it. Intrinsic, by intrinsic, I mean that if you know the weight of the object without referring to the domain in which it's drawn, that's what I call intrinsic. It doesn't have to be local, but you have to be able to say, what is the weight of this object just looking at it? That's all I need from it, right? So that's intrinsic. And that automatically says by restriction because it's de defined this way. I mean, if I deform the domain, I only keep the guys inside and that's, that's all I need. Um, one important point is that it's much better to think of these guys as finite but not probability measures. It's, it's better to keep track of the total weight of the guys. So if you throw some things away when you move the boundaries, you better reduce the total weight. And that's, that has a physical meaning. In the end, I will argue that our point contact conductances are exactly these guys. So that has a physical meaning. That the current actually will go down if you move the boundaries. Um, OK, so there's some kind of a partition function associated with these weights. Okay. Um, now, this parameter that I mentioned that, uh, that specifies this, is, this measures completely is an exponent that appears in the following context. You can 
ask, so suppose you find this probability measure, and you can ask then, if you take a sample from this measure, and then you ask, what is the probability that this sample stays in the subdomain for a given domain A? And the answer is given by this formula. Uh, and in fact, so you can imagine that collection of all these probabilities for all possible sets A completely specifies this measure because you can ask all kinds of tricky questions. So I want to go it through this particular path. What's the probability of that? And so this, this gives you uh, a handle on it, which is a complete characterization of the measure. Okay? And that's the answer. It involves the uh, conformal map. And uh, as written, it's actually, it, it doesn't actually depend on the normalization of the conformal map. It only depends on the fact that this, is, this has to be fixing the points on the boundary. And uh, so these are examples that I already mentioned. The Brownian excursions have h equals 1. Self-avoiding, well, SLE has h equals 5 eighths. So this is a lower bound for to that two-sided restriction. All the other exponents should be bigger. But you can consider, for example, percolation hull condition to avoid only po positive semi-axis. And then it satisfies one-sided restriction with exponent one-third. Again, it's known and it's in the original paper. OK, so from the point of view of this unnormalized partition function, uh, of this partition function, it transforms. If you go from one domain to another, it transforms as a covariantly under conformal transformations. And again, it's a theorem. And uh, so for people familiar with, this, with CFT, this looks like a transformation, the transformation law of a two-point function of primary operators of weight h. So that's, that's an important thing to remember. And uh, you can actually study generalization of this by including some marked points on the boundary and so on. And this will be now defined by partition functions with many mo more insertions and so on. And they all can be characterized by certain martingale properties and they will satisfy certain differential equations that one, one can write explicitly from the theory. OK. Um, now, uh, what does it have to do with SLE? So statistics of restriction measure is fully determined by statistics of its boundary. Because remember, what, what I was saying is that you simply need to ask, what's the probability that this restriction sample lives in a subdomain? But if the boundary of this restriction sample crosses the uh, domain A, it's the same as the sample itself crossing this domain A. So it's, it's, it's one to one correspondence. So in, in a sense, you, you, don't, you don't have to worry about the interior of these guys. You can fill them in and look only at the boundary. And the claim is that the boundary actually is a variant of SLE 8 third. Okay? So it, it's, it's modified by an introduction of some parameters. So in the SLE equation, there's some drift term. And uh, this parameter rho is related to uh, the weight h by a quadratic relation. And people familiar with KPZ would recognize this as a KPZ. So that's the KPZ mapping, actually. Uh, and so, you know, there's some CFT interpretation of this, which I will not go to into. But, uh, um, now, uh, where did you get those? Uh, where did you get those? Uh, these, these ones, yeah. from from uh, Lawler, yeah. Schramm, and Werner. They 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 prove it. It's uh, a it's a theorem in their paper. For, for, for SLE eight third row. So they introduced SLE eight third. SLE kappa rho yeah. in that paper yeah. specifically to describe the boundaries of these objects. And then they, you know, they prove that these boundaries are SLE 8 third comma rho. Um, so now what does it have to do with the pictures in our not network model? So the weights as I presented them are intrinsic. They are non-local, but essentially to find the weight you need to only, only enumerate all the paths that contribute to a picture and count the number of local maxima. So that's an intrinsic, intrinsic property. And so they automatically satisfy restriction property, but only with respect to s absorbing boundaries. Namely, if, I, if you remember what I call the absorbing boundary, it's something where you can enter and you can immediately leave, right? And so I need to, this to uh, have this physical picture correspond to restriction picture because I'm, if I imagine moving the absorbing boundary into the sample, 
some of the pictures that used to contribute to the conductance will not contribute anymore simply because the electron on its way will leave the system through the new boundary, right? So those pictures have to be thrown away. So that's, that's, that's automatically what, what, what is done in the restriction theory. So in this way, if I think of absorbing boundaries, then my pictures should satisfy restriction property with respect to moving the absorbing boundaries. And then we assume conformal variance, and we can use a conformal restriction theory. And immediately, it follows that the mean value of a point contact conductance is simply this partition function of a restriction measure. OK. And so these guys, then, is simply a two-point function of some primary operators in conformal field theory. This alone allows you to specify it completely in many cases. And, uh, but the first order of business is to determine the scaling dimensions of these restri restriction exponents that are associated with, this, with these points. And so once you do this, you can get a lot of analytical results for this average point contact conductances. So these are the summary of exponents that we can consider, more or less. And some of them we know exactly. Some of them we know only numerically. But so for example, if you push the current through an absorbing boundary, we can argue simply using, again, control restriction, that this exactly corresponds to exponent 1. So in the presence of the absorbing boundary, a single point contact creates something that is equivalent to a Brownian excursion. Nothing. So Brownian what? Brownian excursion. Mm -hmm. It's the same restriction measure, same restriction sample. It's indistinguishable. Uh, but if you have this kind of juxtaposition of absorbing and reflecting boundary, whether left or right, this, this, this would produce some one-sided restriction measure with an unknown exponent. And that, that's where the actual physics comes in. In different models, these numbers will be different. Okay? And then there are some exotic things where you can open the boundary only at one point and send in things which cannot go back. So it has to be h equals 0. And uh, there are all kinds of other exponents that one can introduce. And these guys are not known analytically for this model but then only numerically. For other models that I mentioned, for the SU2 model, which was mapped to percolation, all these guys are known explicitly analytically. Uh, for the classical model, where it is just a random Brownian motion with left and right turns, again, all these guys are known analytically. And for the actual physical problem of quantum hole network, these are only some of them are known explicitly. And in this case, actually, you notice that these, these coincide for all the models. So we, we call them super universal. And because essentially these guys are determined solely by restriction, conformal restriction property, nothing else. These guys are more specific to a particular model. And so this is where the distinction between these models comes in. And ideally, we would like to know these guys, but we don't analytically. Uh, but these guys are known. And so. Um, once you suppose you know these exponents from somewhere, some of them are known analytically, some of them are known numerically, you can now imagine having two point contact conductances uh, either in the presence of a dormant boundary or this kind of situation where you put the contacts uh, at points where the re absorbing and reflecting boundaries switch. And in this case, you get two point functions in the upper half plane, which simply be power laws as required by conformal invariance. You can imagine three-point functions where you either put a small portion of reflection boundary in here, thereby enhancing the conductivity, or moving in a little portion of the boundary, thereby reducing the conductance. In either case, the change in the conductance will be given by a three-point function, which is, again, fully uh, determined by conformal invariance. And you can ask more exotic things. You can sort of ask, place one contact here, one contact here. And this is a reflecting interval. And you have to sort of integrate along it and some, some formulas again. So some explicit formulas. And as I said, there are some super universal weights we can, which we can predict. Um, in any case, so what I'm trying to say is that it's, it's a strange story in a sense. We, we get some non-trivial three-point functions dictated by conformal invariance. It's not a big result, in a sense, because conformal field theory really tells you that if you have primary, uh, even quasi-primary fields of certain dimensions, this is what it has to be. So uh, to go beyond this, 
and, and moreover, we don't even know that some of these weights. So, so it's very, very, very partial result. We would like to understand these weights better. What's more, it would be very nice to understand higher point correlation functions. But for that, one needs extra structure. Yes? Yeah. So I skipped it. Um, so when you analyze this kind of situation, you can imagine breaking this sum over the pictures into subsets, where each subset would be characterized by a lift-off point, meaning that it would touch this boundary up to here, but then it never touches the boundary after leaving this point over here. Right? So that's a subset of all the pictures contributing. So if you restrict yourself to the subsets, this point actually looks like uh, a boundary between an absorbing boundary and, and reflecting boundary again. So it's like, uh, so you have some partial summation of some uh, three-point functions again. Once, once you have fixed this point x, a doesn't matter anymore. So this integrand really does not depend on a, as you can see here. Right? It, it's like a three-point function. Right. It's like this three-point function that was, uh, well, more or less like this one. So we, we, um, in any case, you have to integrate over them. And more or less, the fact that you have to integrate over something with a Lebesgue measure tells you that the dimension of the corresponding point is, has to be 1. It's sort of uh, to have finite probability of having this at all, right? So this, this, is, this is what what fixes this exponent here. So again, it's a super universal exponent. And, uh, but what I was going to say is that um, eventually one has to have more structure into the theory to be able to say more about these correlation functions without just, just conformal linearness alone doesn't really help beyond three-point functions, unfortunately. Um, OK, so as I mentioned, there are other systems that satisfy restriction, and we are expect, expect them to have conformal linearness in the limit. So this is this SU2 network model, which has lots of results coming from the mapping to percolation. And as, as I said, in this case, all the dimensions are known analytically. In the classical limit, we also have them. And what's more, there's another. Um, the localization has been classified similar to random matrices. There's a classification of localization problems into 10 symmetry classes. It's an extension of Wigner Dyson classification done, done by Altland and Cernbauer. And um, in one of these classes, you can have a metal in two dimensions, no localization in two dimensions. And uh, this metal has the property that it's almost classical. It's almost like a random motion, Brownian motion in this metal. There's some corrections to the classical behavior. But uh, in, in the first order, it's described by the same as the classical limit of the Chorko coherent network model. And so for that case, we also have the exponents as well. And uh, so I essentially want to finish here by saying that uh, where we would, could go from here. I mean, one, one thing is to, it's worth definitely focusing on the microscopic classical weights that we have obtained and trying to see whether we can make any progress with them by trying to localize them, essentially, right? to have any kind of transfer matrix or something like this. Um, or one idea that we we're you know, playing with is that, as you remember, these restriction measures actually look like, if you look at them, really, they look like sausages strung together. right? And so there are some points like cut points, such that if you remove them, you actually make this set disconnected. And so um, one can Im imagine these points playing a special role. And you can sort of think of doing a renormalization scheme where you sort of integrate them out one by one. And uh, so this may lead to some, 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 some progress eventually. I, I don't know yet. Um, but Directly in the continuum, if we want to stick to this conformal restriction picture, we want to calculate multi-point correlation functions of the type of two-point conductance between points on two absorbing boundaries, but also in the presence of reflecting boundaries. If, if we could calculate this guy, we would know a lot about the system. And particularly, we would predict the localization length exponent and so on. But unfortunately, from the point of view of conformal field theory or restriction theory, this is a six-point function. One, two, three, four, five, six. 
And so this requires a lot more information to be calculated than just conformal invariance. And we don't know anything about these insertions. They're, they're not degenerate operators as far as we know, and so we don't know how to deal with this. And um, another open and really low-hanging fruit, in a sense, is the extension of these guys to the case when contacts are placed in the bulk instead of the boundary. Then it, you would require what's called the radial restriction theory that was promised in the original paper. And only 10 years later, it was finally written up by a student of Mendelin. Uh, so now it's available as a mathematical theory. And so one can just adapt it to this physical situation. Then one can imagine, in principle, going off critical point. So these, these weights that I'm still, they, they still satisfy restriction property. Conformal invariance will be lost. But restriction is still there. And one can think of sort of modifying the restriction, conformal restriction theory towards making it massive, right? Or introducing some exponential decay. It's like having uh, Brownian motions die. There's a, there's a theory of Brownian motions that die, right? And though that in, it introduces some scale into the problem. So we need something similar in the restriction business. And hopefully this can be applied to other disordered systems like spin glasses and stuff like this. But this is a very open problem at the moment. Thank you.